We're here with Stephen Bright, the president and senior counsel of the Southern Center for Human Rights, who just participated in a fascinating discussion at the 2010 ACS National Convention. The panel was on indigent defense, and you outlined during the discussion all of the problems that we're facing. Can you give us a brief summary of that and what we need to do? Well, a lot of people don't realize that in many parts of this country, there really is no adversary system at all. Uh, the prosecution and the police have been getting federal grants for years and years and years, so in the millions and millions of dollars, while on the other side, the public defender offices and the systems that provide representation to poor people accused of crimes have been getting very, very limited amounts of money. The state legislatures, and in some states it's even the county commissions locally, uh, have been very reluctant to give any money. And so this is not just a David and Goliath situation. I mean, this is literally like the New York Yankees playing a, a, your Little League baseball team. I mean, it is just so overwhelming. And, and the way that that plays out uh, is that often when people are on trial, they have lawyers who don't know anything about, for example, an arson investigation. And so the state puts on these experts, may be very questionable, uh, the testimony that they give. Uh, but the lawyers don't know anything about how to cross-examine them. They don't know anything about whether to believe. Or arson, invest, uh, arson person says uh, this glass is uh, cracked in this way, and that shows that an accelerant was used. Uh, the fact of the matter is the glass may have been cracked that way because cold water hit it when they were trying to put out the fire. Uh, but the lawyer doesn't know that. Uh, the same thing for uh, expert testimony on time of death or DNA evidence or, or whatever. Uh, the New Yorker magazine uh, just recently had a piece, or I guess been about some time ago now, uh, about uh, a man put to death in Texas, uh, convicted of arson, where because his lawyers uh, didn't really understand the arson investigation, they allowed him to be convicted and, and, and ultimately executed. Another man convicted of arson had the good fortune of having a very good law firm take over the case, actually bring in the scientists and the forensic people they were able to show the man was innocent, and he walked free. You switch the lawyers in those two cases, uh, and you switch the outcomes. Uh, and the other point that I would make is that in many parts of the country, we really don't have a system. We have, lawyer, we have judges who appoint lawyers. Uh, in Texas and Alabama, uh, judges will just appoint lawyers. Uh, in Texas, for example, there'll be judges who will have like their two or three lawyers who appear before them all the time. Uh, of course, what that means is that the lawyer's loyalty is not to the clients they're representing, it's to the judge, their employer. And if they do anything that alienates that judge or irks that judge, then they're going to lose their business. So you have a whole different dynamic than what the attorney-client relationship is supposed to be about. Uh, and you have uh, lawyers who may not uh, challenge, uh, racial use of uh, peremptory challenges. The prosecutor strikes all the African Americans and instead of challenging that, the lawyer uh, just remains silent uh, about it. Uh, one of the things that I'm seeing increasingly now because the caseloads in the places where there are public defenders are so great uh, that a lot of people, a lot of conscientious public defenders and a lot of public defenders that have a lot of experience are leaving those offices because they just can't deal with representing three, four, five hundred people at the same time. You don't even know what your client's name is. And so you're losing experience. Uh, you're losing the people who can really do a lot of work in a short period of time and you're getting in new people who are inexperienced, don't know what they're doing and the result of that we're in sort of a downward spiral. Uh, in terms of, of those offices and their ability to represent their, their clients. And uh, what's really needed, uh, we need money, we need resources, and a, and a tremendous amount uh, in these systems. Uh, we need structure, we definitely need public defender offices. It's the most cost-effective way to do this because it means you have people working full-time at usually pretty modest salaries with training and supervision. Uh, we need uh, independence because when you don't have independence, when you have judges appointing people and controlling it, uh, very often the lawyers appointed are lawyers who are not going to be capable of uh, uh, representing the clients. They're going to be appointed so that we know what the outcome of the case is going to be as a foregone conclusion. So those are some of the elements of what we need to, to, to try to make some changes in this system.